Thank you so much for coming. As Jerome said, I'm the editor of Art Forum. Um, Nikita did a portfolio uh, for us for the April issue. It, um, it features some drawings, shadows, uh, shadows, shadows on the ground, ground. Um, that he's been working on since the war began. Actually, I'd like to start by asking you uh, how you began with this series of drawings, the uh, invasion almost two months ago, February 24th, um, the latest uh, instance in this ongoing war. Uh, 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 thank you, David. Uh, uh, like, uh, start was uh, in Kiev, uh, like, uh, maybe in a week after February 24th. Uh, like when a full scale invasion uh, started, uh, I was in Kiev for like first uh, three or four days. I spent uh, just in my apartment uh, while uh, there was uh, a bit of panic in the, in the city, and uh, lots of people uh, tried to move out. And uh, I uh, turned uh, to a bit like a uh, condition of sleeping mind. Uh, like uh, I decided that maybe I'll stay at home and uh, watch uh, all uh, Bergman's uh, films I uh, haven't seen before. And uh, when I do all of them, the war will stop. Uh, but uh, then uh, a lot of my friends started like to write and call me like each minute, like you should go to shelter, you should go underground. Uh, and uh, the cellar in our house was uh, really uh, like terrible and ugly. This Soviet blockhouse uh, with a uh, big, uh, wet, uh, dark cellar. And uh, then I was proposed by my friend uh, and uh, artistic collaborator inside of our uh, Arab artistic group, Lesi who is here as well, to uh, go to the gallery called Voloshin. Uh, it uh, is placed uh, underground in a place which uh, was a uh, bomb shelter during Soviet time, during Cold War. And uh, now it's like uh, this white cube gallery space, but underground. And I spent uh, around a month uh, there, and uh, I started to draw. Uh, I had only this, like album with very thin paper in a area of my studio, like Russian troops tried to enter the city. So even I would be stopped by Ukrainian uh, like uh, territorial defense and if I would uh, try to go there. So all my materials were inaccessible. I had only a big uh, album in which uh, before we made drawings together with my daughter and uh, I uh, had some charcoal pencils and I started to uh, draw this uh, plant black soil. And uh, I've seen uh, the photos of uh, uh, cute people Ukrainians and also of uh, Russian soldiers. And uh, uh, I thought about, uh, on, on one hand, it's, uh, you know, Ukrainian territory and uh, soil, which is uh, intervened, like uh, say this non-human world, which is intervened as well, intervened by the war. On other hand, I thought about this national romantic tradition of uh, uh, landscape, uh, landscape uh, from which identity grows. Because uh, you know, Ukraine for uh, centuries uh, didn't have a national state, but uh, it had certain, uh, let's say, national romantic tradition. And the idea of Ukrainian landscape was super important for it. And I thought about this uh, body. Uh, in the landscape, body uh, which uh, uh, is out of any like uh, features of identity, which turns just to black shadow on a black soil. And uh, I started to draw just uh, these bodies as a shadows. Uh, and uh, if the soil, I try to make it very, very material. The bodies are like rather the silhouettes they are immaterial on these drawings. And I started to do more and more and more. Uh, and uh, then uh, I finished uh, the series already in Ivano-Frankivsk, where I was invited uh, also by Lesa to uh, participate, to co-curate the residence working room 
for internally displaced artists. It's a uh, quite important initiative for today's Ukraine. It gives uh, working and living space for the people, for example, from Mariupol, uh, whose houses are just devastated. And uh, they can uh, work there and uh, already like around 20 artists there or maybe even uh, more, we have these very fluid forms of participation. Uh, so I finished the series in uh, ivano frankivsk uh, It's a series of 18 drawings for now. I wonder if we could actually see some of the drawings, if possible. To... Yeah. We have them in the magazine, but they're Yeah, also... we wrote some of the, the original ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're really, they're quite extraordinary. Um, <coughs> You've also been making a series of anti-war declarations. Uh, yes, yeah, there was as a series. Uh, I was invited by a uh, Romanian artist, Dan Perzovsky, whom you may know. Yes. He's uh, like a very strong, important artist and also a great supporter of Ukraine, by the way. He was he invited me to participate in an anti-war uh, project in Bucharest. Uh, where works were for sale and uh, he raised the money for Ukrainian refugees in Romania. And uh, he invited me just uh, to write Stop War mm -hmm. in, let's say, some my manner. And uh, actually, I almost never worked with uh, letters, with text in my work. I just tried to avoid uh, this uh, verbal declaration, uh, uh, dealing rather with image or with uh, what I call poetics of material evidence. Uh, like my installations, like one uh, which uh, is exhibited in uh, School della Misericordia, in the show Defending, Defending Freedom, which will open uh, today. Uh, they contain uh, this material evidences from war zone. But, uh, being invited by Dan, I had to do something with text. And I just wrote this stop war on one sheet of paper like uh, 10 times, uh, like, a, like a ritual. No, actually, now saying stop war uh, it turns to a, this nice humanistic ritual because the question is only how to stop it in a very practical solution in situation of urgency. And uh, then uh, we step from this uh, field of uh, being uh, like good uh, pacifist uh, people to practical solutions of stopping Putin's war machine. Uh, and uh, also it created an effect of rattling letters when, you know, it's just the stop war is like... Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, then I started to, you know, with these uh, newest slogans of uh, this war, like uh, Russian warship, go fuck yourself. It's a very uh, popular Ukrainian slogan, like Ruski Vayenny Karabli Dinakui. It was uh, like you respond of Ukrainian Sigward uh, uh, to Russian military uh, military ship uh, which entered uh, like Ukrainian uh, territory. Uh, so I did all these slogans, uh, but repeating them in a form of ritual. And uh, so there is uh, other series with text. And uh, then I started to make like big drawings with this soil, uh, and uh, now I'm going on uh, with this uh, ground, soil, land, landscape, and uh, its political aspects of wartime. And I think you know this is something that is interesting to me. You've, you've worked in the past as an activist, also, and you and you often are very critical of the state. But something you, we spoke about yesterday is, is uh, the challenge of how to maintain criticality or the role of criticality when you're in war. You know, you, you have there's, there's been a suspension of criticality for the mm -hmm. moment mm -hmm. um, and a transformation in how you yourself work. And I wonder if you could speak to this transformation of a, uh, somebody who's been anti-nationalist in the past to being in this new position. Uh, no, I can't say that I just was anti-nationalist in the past. I am anti-nationalist now as well. Uh, and uh, the issue is not uh, only in uh, like uh, national unity with uh, all the various aspects of it, uh, uh, but a uh, question of uh, survival. So we Ukrainians are now... Uh, like we are attacked as a group and uh, 
Putinist Russia, like a neo imperialist, militarist, and extreme right wing, extreme nationalist state, tries to erase us as a group. And uh, yes, I uh, remember poet Julian Tuvim, who uh, was not so interested in the fact of his being uh, Jewish uh, during uh, like 1920s. But in 30s, he uh, said that only now I feel this uh, like, uh, like intense feeling of uh, like brotherhood with my people. <laughs> so uh, in a peaceful or relatively peaceful time, I uh, was not so interested in this uh, aspect of just uh, being Ukrainian. I was interested rather in uh, these universal social issues and about how they work at our territory, our part of the world. Like uh, this uh, young uh, and uh, very corrupted and often just imitated democracy, uh, this uh, lack of distinction between uh, private and public interest, uh, this uh, also extreme nationalisms as well. But uh, for now, when uh, Russian Federation tries just to erase Ukrainians, yes, I feel a much more connection. But uh, during this period of you no know, like postponed criticality in wartime, I understand that war will not stop tomorrow. Like, let's be realistic, it's for very long. And uh, if we postpone criticality for all this period, we'll turn to like basically a non-democratic state, you know? Imagine if we postponed internal criticality in 2014 when war started. Where would we be now? Yeah. What yeah. Ukraine, Ukraine would be now if in 2014 we would just start to criticize our government, and uh, say that, oh yes, all extreme right-wing organizations are Ukrainians as we are, and uh, we are together, and so on and so on. Where would we uh, uh, remain today? No, we cannot postpone criticality, but we have to be like responsible and uh, make like a proper practical solution. For example, when we explain the issue with extreme right-wing nationalism in Ukraine for international audience, we really have to be responsible and uh, we should always uh, know how Russian propaganda uses the fact of presence of this type of organizations in Ukrainian society. Like, and uh, we have to make uh, very clear distinctions between, uh, like, uh, say, political analyze and propaganda. And, uh, you know, Ukrainian uh, like privilege is uh, to be re really clear and transparent. So, uh, like Putin's propaganda always worked like uh, creating a very, uh, you know, untransparent situation uh, full of uh, like uh, various conspiracy theorists. Uh, actually, Putinist empire is conspirological empire. And uh, Ukraine can afford being transparent, which means being self-critical. Well, I wonder if you, when you speak of this we, you actually you've worked with collectives quite a bit. You've worked, you've actually curated a Caribbean show um, with the Castello de Rivoli. And I wonder if you could also speak just quickly about some of the other artists who you've been in contact with uh, since the invasion began. In 2014, as a member of uh, collective uh, RAP or RAP, uh, like a group which used activist methods and intervened to uh, like squares, the public space, uh, which worked very much with institutional critique. And uh, then uh, we created uh, Hudrada, a group uh, with, uh, in the beginning, like, uh, I guess, 14 members uh, with a very different background. Uh, like uh, sociologists, poets, translators, architects, and uh, we curated exhibitions together. And uh, later I made several curatorial projects, like uh, 
series of uh, exhibitions in the uh, Museum of Soviet Art in Kmytiv, together with Evgenia Muller and uh, Leo Trotsenko, the brilliant collection of post-war Soviet art, which uh, we interpreted uh, through creating dialogues with contemporary works. I curated a show for Ukrainian avant-garde from early 20th century in the Grand Gallery in London. And then I went on with interpreting Ukrainian avant-garde in my artistic practices, like in, in showing a Mumok, uh, like in a, a show Stone, Hit Stone in Pinchuk Center. Uh, and uh, yeah, when I was sitting in uh, this uh, gallery uh, bomb shelter, uh, Karolin Kristof Bakarjiev uh, invited me to make some selection of Ukrainian video works uh, to exhibit in Castello de Rivoli. And uh, I made it like, in fact, during one night I uh, uh, thought about some constellation which will tell something about what Ukraine is, what is what Ukrainian society is, or what uh, like uh, say Ukrainian poetics and Ukrainian discourse is. Uh, and uh, these works uh, relate to very different aspects, like from uh, war and military propaganda and uh, young and uh, wild capitalism and uh, this young uh, queer underground scene of Ukrainian youth and uh, Soviet heritage and uh, ways of dealing with it, like very different aspects. And there were works uh, like of Yaroslav Futimsky, Yuri Lederman, Antigona, Alina Kleitman, uh, uh, Alexei Sai, and uh, many other brilliant Ukrainian artists, mainly of younger generation, but not only. So, yeah, I am used to work with people, and uh, you know, institutional system in Ukraine always was underdeveloped. And uh, we almost never had uh, curatorial shows, which we uh, like to be in. Uh, we never had them inside of the country. And then we decided that then we should create exhibitions ourselves. If we uh, miss the context, we should create it. And what is it like also, you know, I think we'll wrap this up very quickly, but I wonder what's it like, you've been in Venice before, you've been representing, representing artists here. What is it like to be here now? Uh, this time to be seeing the Biennale, to be participating in the Biennale. I have really mixed feelings uh, about this. Uh, I got temporary permit uh, to leave Ukraine uh, till uh, 2nd of May. Uh, it's because uh, the show Defending Freedom uh, has the uh, Office of Ukrainian President as a partner. So it was supported uh, by Ukrainian uh, governmental structures and they made me this permit. Uh, and when I cross the border, to Romania by the pedestrian pass. I took a plane from Yasse from Romania to Venice. Like the border guard, he looked like documents are fine, but uh, if you will not be back in time, you'll get 10 years as for everybody. So, um, uh, yeah, this situation and uh, it's not that uh, Ukrainian uh, like artists, like male artists can uh, uh, easily travel. Now maybe it's even somehow good that the uh, world is so open uh, for Ukrainian artists and lots of Ukrainian female artists can uh, use this presence. And uh, male artists participate rather digitally. And uh, it's okay. Uh, I suggest maybe on... Uh, some program of uh, you no know, uh, mental health care oriented uh, post war residence residences for male artists from Ukraine <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, yeah but uh, for now I got this permit and uh, I use it to be here and then to be in Antwerp uh, in uh, some discussion with uh, Euro Euro. Euro Parliament members, because now as a big Ukrainian project is prepared between the uh, Muka Museum in Antwerp, Bozar in Brussels, and European Parliament, which will be an exhibition venue and say discussion forum as well. So maybe I can gain some support for Ukraine uh, this way. I wonder if we could take just maybe a 
couple questions if anybody has something that they'd like to ask. Um, we'll open it up. If anybody has a question, please feel free. Um, How do you feel about the Russian uh, pavilion? Like that is, like when? Uh, how do you feel that nothing happened that, uh, here? It's closed. I think uh, it's a uh, hundred percent good that Russian pavilion at Biennale is closed. But uh, also, it's important that uh, artists who participated there, Alexandra Sukhareva and Kirill Savchenkov, they uh, declined themselves as well as uh, curator. Raimund uh, So it means that uh, lots of uh, participants of uh, Russian art scene feel their own responsibility. So it's not about like international boycotting of Russian culture, but about certain form of self boycott from the side of uh, conscious members of uh, Russian art community. And uh, I understand that uh, now it's a hard time for uh, Russian art scene. It's a really difficult time. It's uncomparable with situation of Ukrainian artists who uh, are all inside of a country hearing the explosions. And uh, like uh, one artist already uh, just uh, disappeared and he was found uh, months uh, later in Mariupol. Like, uh, there was a great uh, uh, Lithuanian uh, film director, uh, Mantas Kvadavrevichus, uh, who was killed in Mariupol. Uh, yeah, it's uncomparable, like, uh, situation of ours and situation of uh, Russian artists. But maybe, it seems that uh, now, when Putinism transforms to pure totalitarianism, maybe it was just uh, one of these Eastern European post-socialist kleptocratic authoritarianism before 2014. And uh, now it quickly transforms to a new fascism, to totalitarianism. Maybe now a lot of Russian intellectuals will face the challenge to, became, to become real dissidents. And uh, maybe uh, it's time for them to like, recall uh, names like Varlam Shalamov. Uh, so the, I trust in uh, consciousness intellectuals, but I am uh, for full boycott of Russian state run and uh, corporate institutions which are connected with Putin's war machine. Any other questions? Do you yeah. think in the long term this is also a chance that institutional awareness will change in Ukraine? In museums, there are so many contacts now, so many museums from abroad supporting to save collections in Ukraine. I think, I think this yeah. will change the curatorial awareness also in these institutions through these international contexts? Yes, Raman, I think so. Uh, but also uh, the infrastructure of art inside of the country will not work for several years maybe. But uh, institutions which will be able to act as part of international networks, they will get maybe more attention and uh, maybe it will be possible, let's say, to redistribute uh, international resources for survival of art and culture in Ukraine. But also, I uh, consider it not uh, being uh, some form of charity or political or cultural charity, but if the struggle with uh, Putinist aggression is our common struggle, is our common self-defense, because Putin's war is a war against uh, Europe and against, like, uh, let's say, very idea of democracy. Not only, like, what we call Western democracy, but against democracy in general. So it means that our, it's our common struggle and our common self-defense. So maybe saving, protection, and uh, cooperating with uh, Ukrainian cultural, culture and cultural actors 
it's also sort of a common task. And maybe this brain can bring some experience, knowledge, which uh, will be useful for international community. Or maybe even in situation of war, we have something to share as well. And I think, I think maybe that's it. I feel like you have a long day ahead of you. And I, yeah. I Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. <laughs>